Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and many of you who have been watching L'Chaim for lo these many years, have heard me often talk of how one of my greatest loves and passions after my family and all things Jewish is the Broadway musical. I've even told you that as much as I loved baseball as a child, I never dreamed of playing center field for the Brooklyn Dodgers or for the New York Mets. But I often dreamed of writing a Broadway musical. And to this day, when the lights dim and the overture begins, it's not simply that I get chills, I actually tear up. Somehow the music touches my soul and I thrill to every moment of the entire production, even more so when there's an extraordinary talent on stage. Barbara Streisand, Zero Mostel, Chita Rivera and Eliza Minnelli, Audrey McDonald, Kelly O'Hara, James Norton, Joel Gray, and Alex Brightman and Leslie Kritzer. The list is endless. But for me, as mesmerizing as the performance may be, the star of the show for me is the composer and lyricist. Many of you know I have the, had the good fortune and fun and some success being part of many Broadway productions as a producer. I've been up close and personal with some fabulous actors leading and supporting. But whether it's a musical or a straight play, for it to be successful, it's all in the writing. And for a musical, it's all in the music and the lyrics and the story. So the star of the show for me has always been the composer and lyricist. And every now and then, both off camera and on, I have the chance to speak with the creative geniuses of the Broadway musical world. And one of the finest, best musicals, not simply of the last few years, but of all time, is one I hope many of you have seen. It's called Dear Evan Hansen. If you haven't seen it, whenever Broadway finally reopens again, do yourself a real favor. Get tickets to see Dear Evan Hansen. It is brilliant. And Dear Evan Hansen makes my point. The original actor in the title lead, playing a troubled high school student who becomes caught up in his own fantasy and lie, was Ben Platt. He was simply out of this world. He won the Tony for Best Actor in a Musical. One of six Tonys Evan Hansen would win in 2017. And my wife Ruth and I just marveled at Ben Platt's performance. And when Ben moved on, my wife and I thought, well, no one will ever be able to play Evan Hansen like Ben Platt. What's going to happen to the show? But then Noah Galvin took over the role. It was out of this world. Why? Well, because Ben Platt and Noah Galvin are very accomplished actors, but more so because they were in a musical written by two exceptionally gifted composers and lyricists, Benj Pasek and Justin Paul, who in many ways are today's Rodgers and Hammerstein, 
Lerner and Lowe, Candor and Ebb. They're this era's greats of the Broadway musical. They're known now in the world of musical theater and film simply as Pasek and Paul. The two met as students at the University of Michigan's musical theater program, discovered they shared a love for another fabulous composer and playwright, Jason Robert Brown, whom I also happened to adore and with whom I had the thrilling opportunity to work with on Broadway in the Bridges of Madison County. And Benj and Justin became fast friends and brilliant collaborators, even as students. And in addition to Dear Evan Hansen, which earned Pasek and Paul a Tony for Best Original Score. By the way, Stephen Levinson, we should mention, won the Tony for Best Book of a Musical. Benj Pasek and Justin Paul also wrote the lyrics for the huge musical film hit starring Ryan Gosling and Emma Stone, La La Land, for which they won the Academy Award and Golden Globe for Best Original Song, City of Stars. And then the two wrote nine original songs for the Hugh Jackman film, The Greatest Showman, the story of P.T. Barnum. They also wrote the Tony-nominated Broadway show, A Christmas Story, among their many other credits. They've won a slew of awards. And on this edition of L'Chaim, lucky, lucky me, we're joined not only by a huge musical talent, but also by a lovely human being, Benj Pasek. Benj, thank you so much for making time for us and the JBS audience. It is wonderful to be sitting with you. I'm thrilled to be here across Zoom, and uh, that was such a lovely introduction. I, I, I feel like my mom will be very, very proud uh, of you and me for, for such a good introduction. That's sweet of you to say. I hope your mom's watching. I'm sure she will. So be before we talk about the world of the Broadway musical, I want to understand who in the heck you are and how you come to be a, you know, one of the shining lights now in the Broadway and the film musical world. So I want to know, where were you born and who were your parents and where did they bring you up and what kind of Jewish home did you grow up in? Yeah, um, so I'm from outside of Philadelphia uh, and I lived there up until I went to college. My mom is a professor, my dad is a lawyer, um, and my dad uh, and mom are both really involved in a lot of Jewish organizations. Um, my dad was the president of the Philadelphia chapter or Pennsylvania chapter of the American Jewish Congress for a while, an organization called JEBS. Uh, uh, and my mom, you know, has worked with the Steven Spielberg's foundation and the JCCs across North America and done a lot of things within, you know, Jewish. Um, you said she was a professor, a professor of what? She's a professor of developmental psychology at Temple University. Very nice. What are your parents' names? Kathy is my mom and Jeff is my father. Okay. And now what about, the, you know, I understand your parents really were involved in Jewish life in your home. Yeah. Was there Shabbat on Friday? Not, what kind of Jewish home did you have? Totally. We had, um, we had a group of families that uh, my whole life, we had a Shabbat group and, you know, it'd be a group of a couple families that would always come together and, you know, have Shabbat dinners and, you know, we all did the whole Hebrew school thing. And, you know, it was definitely a community outside of Philadelphia. Um, and, and that whole group we're still very close to and, um, you know, see each other. You know, our Chinese, our Chinese food on Christmas, we celebrate together. And, you know, all of those, uh, all of those traditions, high holidays, all of it. Um, so it's, yeah, still a tight-knit group. And I think really foundational for me as a kid to be able to have a group of, you know, families and then also, you know, a synagogue community. Um, to yeah to, to have that uh to have that connection you know by the way there are many young people and although you're no longer a child you're still a young person but there are many people your age who did not grow up with that kind of you know jewish warmth in their home yeah. and i assume you appreciate it but you're aware again many just don't have it benj yeah, no, I know. Um, and I, I, 
consider myself really, really lucky to have had to have had that upbringing. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm I'm very conscious now of you know how do we you know as I become more of an adult uh, uh, and you know a part of a more communities, how do I help to facilitate um, you know a sense of community and bonding and and something that's rooted in something that's deeper than um, you know, just, just friendship. And I think that a lot of that can be found in Judaism. Good for you. By the way, I should ask you, did you go to Hebrew school? Oh, I did. Did oh, you I... hate it? Did you hate it? Um, you know, I think that that's part of the, uh, the, <laughs> the rite of passage is to, to have some contentious relationships with uh, Good your... for you. Good for you. Exactly. But you know, in, in, uh, in having, uh, quarrels with you know the Hebrew school teachers or whatever I think that you then get to define what you want your own kind of relationship with Judaism to be and I think you know the stronger that one maybe pushes against it it means that uh they care you know they say that uh what is it the opposite of of uh hate is not love it's indifference so you know I think that sometimes when you really get mad about something it's because you have passion behind it that is so perceptive. By the way, as you've worked through your own Judaism, and again, you're still a young guy, but to the extent to which you have, mm. um, to what extent is Jewish identity part of your core? To what extent is Israel involved in your life? To what extent is it there, but it's really on the periphery? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty, I'd say it's, Sometimes it's on the periphery and sometimes it's really front and center. I mean, for me, um, I have very close friends who live in Israel. So, you know, I go there often, uh, you know, sometimes even a couple times a year. That's um, lovely. Yeah. And I have a lot of friends who, who live there. So I feel very close to, you know, Israeli culture in particular. Um, and my friends there and restaurant scene and, you know, Tel Aviv and all of that. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that there's sort of a, a question that you're asking sort of dovetails in the sense that I think, you know, we're living in a time, literally, we're doing this interview right on Zoom. Coronavirus has exposed how isolated, you know, we are. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's, it's been, a, it's just been building over the last, you know, 10, 15, 20 years that we've, you know, with the advent of social media and all of this, we've become lonely people. And, um, and, and, in, and siloed. And I think, you know, when we've become siloed and more, you know, isolated, there is a real craving for connection and community. And, um, and, you know, the busier our lives are and in cities and the fact that we can just text each other or, you know, see what someone's, you know, doing on Facebook or whatever, it means that we can remove ourselves from having to physically be together as a community. So, you know, to me, a big part of what I want to try to crack open for myself and for um, other people is how do you how do you you know go back towards a sense of what community means and and what is that rooted in and you know I think that you can have it in a lot of different ways you know I'm, I'm certainly I'm a part of a Broadway community but I'm also a part of a Jewish community I think that 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 means that you need to cultivate that and how do you cultivate community with Judaism in mind um, and that's something I'm, I'm very conscious of and something that I'm, I'm trying to, to do more so in my life. Well, that is lovely for me to hear. Good for you. One la last question, and then I want to begin to talk about music. Go for it. What was Passover like in the Patsik home? <laughs> yeah, my parents are very, like, non-traditional. Um, non-traditional traditionalists, I guess I'd say. So, I mean, Passover for us, uh, my, my parents always built – um, a Bedouin tent inside my living room, you, hanging sheets and, you know, having throw pillows. And my parents would dress up as Pharaoh and Moses. And it was a very theatrical event. And, you know, it's funny. It's like as part of my exploration of how to bring communal events uh, to, you know, my own, my own New York City lifestyle, I've, you know, kind of recreated some of that and had bigger Passover events and brought in people from the Broadway community. And yeah, this, I mean, this year, for instance, um, we did our first, because of COVID, our, our first digital Passover. So we created this thing called Saturday Night Seder, which was uh, a, basically a way to have a communal event through streaming. Um, but that was really meaningful to me too, because, you know, how do we take these great traditions and try to share them with people? Uh, 
who otherwise we wouldn't be able to spend time with um, and have, have that kind of communal experience come through. Very, very impressive. Very impressive. All right. You heard me you know, talk a little bit about what the Broadway musical means to me, and it's meant that to me since I was a child. Amazing. When do you fall in love with this world that you want to begin to you know, make it your own? Yeah. Well, first of all, what was your what was your first Broadway show that you saw? Do you remember? You know, I'm not for my first shows were at PS ninety eight uh-huh. on West End Avenue and ninety sixth Street, where my aunt would write Broadway musicals. Okay. And these kids went to this public school, and my cousins went to the public school, and every year my aunt would write the the musical that was in the school. Those are the earliest. The one that first moved me powerfully was Camelot. Oh, yeah. Classic. Classic. And Camelot, they say, is really about the Kennedy uh, administration, uh, if, you, if you strip it all away. Which Absolutely. Is, yeah, really cool. Um, I, you know, I, I'm trying to think of like, the moment that I fell in love with theater. I got to give my mom a lot of credit because though she was a professor by day, she sort of moonlit as a, a songwriter and a, she wrote a lot of children's albums. So she would kind of take these moments that were happening in our childhoods and translate them. And she was sort of like the, the Raffi of you know, the Philadelphia area with a, a collaborator of hers. And so I grew up having five albums of children's music of my life, you know, sort of documented. And so I got to sort of be on the f- sort of, I don't know, the front lines or the, the uh, uh, I don't know what the term would be, just like right up close and personal, front seat of, of getting to see how you translate a moment in someone's life and you put it into a song. And so that I think was really, really influential um, for me. And um, when I began to grow up and, you know, I de- developed a love of singing and a, a love of songwriting and you know, my, my mom's music group, they like performed at like Bill Clinton's White House Easter egg roll one year. And I got to sing a song at the White House, you know, so wow. like I, I, I grew up with this thing of like, oh, like I really, you know, this is really cool that you can like write songs and then someone can sing them. And then there's an audience like that, that there was a very natural A to B to C, you know, for me. And then I, um, I joined this thing called the Philadelphia Boys Choir, which was an amazing experience. And I got to um, travel to... Australia and also South Africa, just post apartheid. Um, and, you know, getting to see the power of music. And it, it was really amazing of really seeing, you know, a culture that was really still split and reckoning with, um, you know, this, this very racist past. Um, and getting to see music as this uh, agent of change and this ability to sort of heal a broken peoples. Um, so I think those experiences were really formative for me. So then when I think about shows, I mean, a couple things come to mind. One is, um, you know, live theater. I remember seeing a production of The Sound of Music, which was a big, big deal for me. Um, and I don't think anyone in my generation could dismiss the incredible impact that Alan Menken and Howard Ashman's music had on them, who of course, wrote uh, all of the songs for the Disney Renaissance um, for these incredible animated films like The Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin and these incredible films. So for me, you know, being a four-year-old, getting to sit in the theater and getting to hear music be uh, a way that someone told her story, you know, and seeing the, the mermaid Ariel all of a sudden express her deepest, you know, feelings and thoughts through song, was really, really influential. And it basically gave permission in my mind, and I think in a lot of people in my generation's mind, that anyone or anything can sing to express how they feel. Um, And so that was really meaningful. And then the first Broadway show that I saw actually on Broadway was The Lion King. And uh, so I think Disney, uh, like many in my generation, had a a really, really big impact on being sort of the gateway drug. Um, Then the show that I think really changed everything for me was Rent. Um, because I got to really see how um, issues that, you know, even though I was relatively young, uh, that felt very contemporary and almost taboo to, you know, not 
be something that you could put into a musical theater show in the way that we traditionally would have thought about it or the way that I would have known about it from Disney movies. It could, it could be something where you could sing about anything, whether that be, you know, non-traditional relationships or the AIDS crisis or, you know, anything. And so I think all of those experiences were permission giving to say, hey, musical theater and music is a medium that is, uh, is a way to tell stories. And, um, and there, there's, very, there's very few uh, examples of things where you can't use a song to express something really, really large about the world and also something really personal um, from a character's point of view. Bowie, that's, that is so lovely to hear you say it that way. And it's interesting. The difference between Lion King and Rent, <laughs> you know, it's like almost two ends of the continuum, Benj. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But but that's what's so special, I think, about the art form is, you know, that uh, shows that that really challenge what our assumptions of what a musical can be. You know, like that's why I think many people uh, love Stephen Sondheim so much is that, you know, his work has really challenged the assumptions of what you could write about, you know, and and the sophistication uh, of what subject matter and 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 work can be, uh, you know. We don't have to be limited by, um, you know, while musical comedies are great, you know, that the form can hold a multitude of different stories. And, and that's exciting to be able to, to write anything. Yes. And now you're part of it. By the way, have you met Stephen Santa? I have, yeah. Uh, and, and any and all interactions with him, I, I am such a fan that I have like a picture every time I've ever been in a room with him or like a signature of something. You know, so I, I'm, I don't have any cool about it at all. So I have to work on. Good for you. I have to work on, yeah, trying to be a little cooler. Uh, and, and by the way, you know, there's some people who are now going to feel the same way about you. <laughs> and, well, and, and, and one of, you know, at what point, ben, first of all, what musical instruments do you play? Um, I play the piano. My collaborator is a, more of the pianist, though, and I really love lyric writing and storytelling, and I also sing. Okay. At what point do you realize or do your parents realize that, you know, you have unusual talent <laughs> and people have talents in different areas and they can be brilliant in various areas. You are blessed with a brilliance. At what point do you, your family, do you realize that, yes, you have a gift here, you have a talent. At what point? Um, you know, I th that's very nice of you to say. And, and this is not me trying to be like falsely modest in any way. I think I had a lot of advantages growing up, not only of, you know, coming from a nice Jewish home, but also literally having a mom who would write songs. You know what I mean? Literally having a wonderfully funded theater program that a lot of people don't get to have so that I could, you know, be in musicals and have those experiences. So to me, I think, you know, the odd part is that I think there are a lot of people who have incredible amounts of talent. And, um, and a lot of it, I think, is just that they, a lot of it is either resources or fear. And those are the two things that I think keep the world from hearing from so many more people that are actually really, really potentially extraordinary. So while I appreciate you saying what you say, I think that, you know, one, I loved it. And I think that when you're passionate about something, you do it naturally and you get better at it. I wish that I had the same passion for working out because then, you know, I'd be in a lot better shape, but I don't. But I really do have a passion, you know, for, for musical storytelling. And, um, and, and, and I think also when you have people who encourage you, uh, you believe that you're capable, you know, uh, very early on one having a mom who wrote songs but two having teachers and and other people believe in and encouraging you know work that i was doing whether that be early poetry or early songwriting or whatever it is it's like when you believe that you can do something that builds on itself you know and and i think that at a certain point then um we have this this you know feeling of like oh well someone's extraordinary and i, I believe that there are extraordinary brilliant people i personally i don't think that i'm i'm off the charts in that way. I think that I've been given a lot of resources, a lot of encouragement, 
and it, it allowed me to continue to progress and continue to work and continue to get better. And, you know, I think I'm, I'm just very grateful for, for that encouragement and, um, and those resources and opportunities. And, you know, as I do get older and, and, and become more exposed, I realize, wow, there are so many people out there with tremendous talent. And, you know, how do we hear from more of them? And how do we create systems in place where those people get the same kinds of advantages um, that I did? Uh, because, you know, there should be and must be more of a democratization about who gets to have access to those opportunities, because there are a lot, a lot, a lot of really, really brilliant minds with a lot of beautiful and interesting and diverse stories to tell. I mentioned at the beginning, you know, people have reputations. You have a reputation as being a very lovely person. You are more than a lovely person. And I understand it was not false modesty. You were, you were describing something you think is real. Where did you go to high school? I went to a Quaker school outside of Philadelphia where a lot of the schools are, are um, a Quaker with a Quaker lens called Friends Central, um, which was, I'd say, probably 50% Jewish. <laughs> so, yeah, but, uh, yeah uh, like a very sort of liberal, um, like Quaker environment that was very sort I understand. of Jewish as well, yeah. Then you get into the Michigan Musical Theater Program. By the way, Everybody should understand, within the musical theater world, one of the absolute premier schools is the Michigan Musical Theater Program. No, you're right. I mean, it was definitely a dream school for me. You know, among schools that specialize in it, it's definitely among the top, uh, the top you know, and a lot of my friends, you know, even out of my year uh, in particular, I mean, have just gone on to have really, really wonderful careers and and um, yeah, I, I think I was, that's another, you know, another reason that I think that I was able to um, have success is not only did I meet my collaborator at Michigan, um, but when you're around other people that are, you know, talented and high achieving and believe, you know, in the merits um, and, and the, the, uh, the possibilities, you know, of at, that, that, their dreams could be valid and real, then you believe it too, you know? And when you're around people that don't believe that, then you get discouraged. So again, like I just was in another environment where I was made to feel like my dreams uh, were valid and that I had, you know, opportunity. Uh, and, and that kind of, that kind of community and environment, I think begets opportunities and confidence. Okay. What were your dreams? when you were in at Michigan? <laughs> I, so I think um, going into school, the only real experience that I had, while I had written songs you know, by myself uh, you know, on a piano, the only real understanding that I had of the world of Broadway was one where one could be a performer. So I went to school as a performer, and I thought, okay, I'll you know, do that. I very quickly uh, felt that when I was there, the kind of love of learning to, you know, read a monologue and deliver it well, like that wasn't what I was passionate about. But there were certain elements, you know, that were tied into what I was learning about that I was. So um, very quickly, I kind of pivoted from uh, having this sort of dream of being on Broadway to having this dream of getting to participate in that world and in that, you know, in that landscape. And I really quickly found that I loved to write songs. And a lot of the, the things that I was learning about how to be a, a performer of Broadway songs really, really easily translated into uh, how one might write them, you know? So learning things about how character development works or how, you know, you need to develop something with specificity. You know, my collaborator, Justin Paul, whom I met at school and I, we, you know, would take these classes and all of a sudden when we started to write songs ourselves, we'd say, okay, well, if we're going to bring this into a, a classroom where an actor's going to need these specific tools, how do we, when we're writing a song, put all those tools in it so it's really easy for the actor to find? And so that education, though not directly, I know, about musical writing, was very, very responsible for how I have any kind of understanding about writing for character in the first place. And, and totally changed the trajectory of then what I wanted to do. Fascinating, fascinating. And 
again, when you read, if, if anybody reads about you, we read, so you meet Justin at uh, Michigan. Yeah. But is there any more to the story? How do you, you know, how do you become as good friends and how do you understand that there's this, you know, simpatico between you? <laughs> well, we met uh, during our college freshman orientation. So before we even got to school as freshmen, for the orientation, we were in the same group. And, you know, we had a similar sense of humor. He's uh, very socially observant of people. And I think that's something that I tend to, I gravitate towards, like, you know, observing human behavior is something that I'm really interested in. And he also is a really, really wonderful musician. And so uh, during our freshman year, I would be playing sort of some pop songs that I had been writing. And originally I had wanted to recruit him to enhance the pop songs that I wrote. And when we just got in a room together, you know, him on the keyboard, you know, him on the keys and me like, you know, at a laptop or just sort of like riffing around it, we began to just create our own stuff. And it was at the exact right time of us feeling like, you know, we had the world in front of us and we were in a, a place where we had a lot of freedom to be able to experiment. And we were learning so much about how song make, songwriting and, and the craft of songwriting occurs that it was this confluence of all these different events that we were like, oh, maybe we could do this. And, and it started a path for us. And if you get to work with um, people that make you, you know, happy and uh, joyful, and you get to work on things that are joyful, I think you naturally give more effort to them um, and work harder on them and, uh, and end up, yeah, wanting to create, staying up later, putting, putting more time and, 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 uh, and more effort into it. You've mentioned now a couple of times that what draws you to this is musical storytelling. Yeah. And I, it's, it's interesting. I've talked to a lot of people who write music, write lyrics, and obviously they're telling stories, but I've never heard anybody identify it so clearly. I want you to talk for a moment about what it means and, you know, it comes from inside you, obviously. What is it about for you and what are you trying to do? And just give me a riff for a moment on musical storytelling. Sure. So if someone were to ask like what my job is, um, I don't think that I would describe it as, I mean, maybe if I were being uh, just trying to not have a long conversation with them, I'd say a songwriter. But I think that Justin and I would both you know, if you really were to ask us, we'd say we, we're, we're dramatists. And really our job is to tell stories. And the way that we tell those stories is through music. Um, you know, there are ways to tell a song within, or there are ways to tell a story within the context of one song. Um, and when we first started writing songs, you know, that's how we understood how to tell those stories, which is how do you start here and end here all in four minutes and it's a self-contained you know little narrative which is more akin to a pop song a billy joel song or some of the work by jason robert brown you know uh, these songs in song cycles where like an entire world is in you know a four minute bubble but the more that you investigate musical theater um you see that an entire story can be told through music um or that the apex of emotional um, moments that a character is going through, those things are expressed through song. And so once we graduated from learning how to write a song with a story, then the real goal was, okay, how do we take a, a longer story that is, you know, two hours, two and a half hours in length and take um, the, the most meaningful moments and make those, you know, musical. And, you know, why do that, one might say? Well, like, what I think is so extraordinary about the form, you know, you can go and you can see an orchestra, you can go and you can see a play, you can go and you can hear um, someone sing at a concert, you can go and see a dance recital, but when you put all of those incredible theatrical elements together, and they're all working in concert, the amount of expression that one can give to a character, both um, the internal workings of a human and, you know, and the external world, I think is bigger than any of those art forms individually. And so the potential of, I think, what musical theater can do 
is something so expansive. You know, what songs can do is it can let us inside of the heads of our characters and get to hear their hearts and, and their emotions, you know, so we get to, we get to really understand them. And, and, you know, most, most of the time people are not vulnerable enough to tell you what they're really feeling. And ironically, most of the time we don't even know what we feel ourselves. You know, we're almost, we're blocked most of the time from even understanding our own emotions. So to kind of take this shortcut for an audience to really get past all of the bravado or all of the insecurity or all of the walls that a person might put up in everyday life and get to hear from them, you know, past all of that and get to hear really what's inside their head and accompany it with emotion. That's the cool thing about what music can do is that it literally provides a bed of, is it, you know, what, what, the music is going to tell you so much about the feeling and the words are going to tell you about sort of the intellect. And when you put feeling and intellect together and you let us inside over a wall past the guard of, of a human, you know, you really get to reveal a lot about um, a character. And, and then, you know, just to take it one step further, revealing something really um, deeply uh, personal about a character also allows people in an audience to identify with an emotion that they might not have known how to express before. You know, so often when we see someone on stage express something, we think, oh my God, I feel that too. You know, or, oh my God, they, they think that maybe, oh, the writer who wrote that or the characters who are thinking that or the other people in the audience who are laughing or crying with this thing that I thought was unique to me, it reminds us of our own humanity and our shared human experience. Um, and so the combination of all of those things, I think it's just very, very special. You know, that you have that emotion, that intellect, and that sense of community all in a shared space. Um, and that's something that I think musical theater can do in a really unique way. Wow. <laughs> Just, well, have you said this before? Is this something that you have talked about often? No, or I mean, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm trying to think certain elements, uh, you know, of this, I, I, I guess I've talked about, but like. It was, by the way, you gave me chills. You make me cry. You make me cry. Very sweet of you. You know, say. by the way, have you ever cried in a theater? All the time. I mean, you know. All the time. Tell me once. Come on. I mean, I, name a show where I haven't. You know, that's, to me, that's the beauty of, of, of the experience is that you're sitting with a thousand people. And a moment comes where you see this bit of shared humanity and yeah, you recognize something in yourself and it, it allows you to release and, and it's permission giving. And what's also per permission giving is getting to hear the other people around you, you know, sniffle or wipe, you know, watch them wipe a tear from their eye. And, and it's just a huge reminder of our own collective sense that we are all in this crazy thing called life together and that's the beauty of theater and particularly live theater you know is that we're li like we're living and breathing in that shared collective space and getting to experience the highs and the lows you know in a very compact two hours you know we're getting to see an entire journey or an entire story where we get to live those highs and lows together and it reminds us of you know that we're alive so tell me about how you end up doing Evan Hansen, dear Evan Hansen. Yeah. You don't, you, you and Justin did not do the book. No. I don't, so I don't know how the three of you come together and decide on the story yeah. and then how the story evolves. What's the story about the story? <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, dear Evan Hansen was something that Justin and I wanted to write, uh, from when we were in college. Um, but we knew Why? Um, I think, you know, what, what I was kind of hinting at earlier of the world becoming increasingly isolated, the sort of breakdown of community, this need, uh, for us as human beings to, you know, find community and find each other has just become, it's reaching a crisis point, frankly. And if you look at the statistics of suicide rates and isolation and, and depression and anxiety, I mean, it's just through the roof. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that we're living our lives online. We don't connect with other people. We're not physically with other people. Obviously, Corona has, you know, shown, <laughs> shown that, you know, exponentially. Um, and the idea for Evan Hansen is, you know, as we become lonelier and as we become so desperate for this need to connect to other people, what are we willing to do to achieve that, you know? 
And so it's really the story about a boy who feels so lonely, so disconnected, so unseen, so unheard, um, and, and so scared that when an opportunity presents itself where he can um, be believed to have been the best friend of a kid who now uh, has lost his life, he jumps at that opportunity because it means, oh my God, someone's finally paying attention to me and there's someone who's willing to give me love in this world. And I think we are all, um, we are all in, you know, in need of being loved and we're all in need of feeling like we matter. Um, and so, you know, the story was constructed, you know, with that in mind, especially with, you know, the advent of social media and how that has exacerbated a lot of these issues of loneliness. And so we, we uh, read a lot of plays and found this incredible playwright, Stephen Levinson, who's a guy who's our age and who really understood what we were trying to say. Um, and then we began a, a many year collaboration to develop this story um, that, you know, was just uh, from the seed of a kernel of an idea. Okay. Um, this, this was an idea that emanated out of you and Justin? Yeah. So there was a, a student who passed away at my high school. Um, and I remember, you know, everyone after his death claiming to be better friends with him than they really were, including myself, just wanting to be a part of this tragedy that I seriously had no place in. And, you know, part of our instinct at first was to write a musical that was very much a condemnation of why do people do that? Why do people jump on the grief bandwagon? Um, but the more that we got into it and the more that we realized what the power of musicals can do, we realized who are we to judge these characters who also, by the way, had a lot of ourselves in them, you know? So judging it was a very irresponsible and, um, and disingenuous thing to do. Where, where were you? Uh, the characters i mean there i mean i think we're in all of the characters but in the evan hansen character a, a kid who feels lonely and in need of love and in need of attention and you know so desperate to be heard that definitely are elements of my high school self in there and elements of justin and steven's high school selves you know in there and i think that's one of the reasons why that character has resonated with so many people is because in a way you know we all feel um like we want to like, like we're not heard in the way that we want to be heard. We're not seen in the way that we want to, we want to be seen and that we want to matter in a way that we don't feel like we do. Um, and, and what so, about writing the music that ultimately goes into Evan Hansen's mouth? And there are a lot of, well, it's a full cast. There are a lot of songs and Dev, Evan Hansen doesn't do all of them, but yeah. the character Evan Hansen really carries the musical theme of the show yeah. and the most important songs are ones that he does. Yeah. And so tell me how the music develops. Yeah. So, you know, we very much are writers who write from the perspective of character. So that's the very first thing that we do. We never will write a song and then say, Hey, how do we stick this into a plot? We'll always say, who is this character? What is he going through? What is he trying to express? What does he need? What does he want? What does he want the world to know about him? What is, he, what is he craving? What does he want to change? And then we try to find a musical articulation for that. So Evan Hansen is a kid who's set in a, it's set in a contemporary world. You know, the set on, on Broadway, is, there are screens all around him because he's being swallowed by this digital internet you know, universe that is unrelenting in commanding his attention and swallowing him whole. Um, and, you know, how do we write songs that feel like they musically sound contemporary, lyrically, they sound truthful and contemporary. And then we just try to say, what does that character want? And, you know, one of his big songs early on is a song called Waving Through a Window, which is a song that is basically saying, like, I'm furiously trying to have someone notice me. And it's as if no one's waving back. You know, obviously with the metaphor too, it talks about, you know, tapping on the glass and waving through a window about, you know, it's also your digital screens too, and trying to communicate and having nobody on the receiving end. Um, and yeah, while a lot of the songs are, you know, from Evan's point of view, uh, there are other songs that are from, you know, the parental point of view. One of the things that we really learned in developing the show was that this is not just a coming of age story. It's about a boy who wants a family and a family who is in desperate need of a son that they've lost. And it's about a mom who feels okay. separated and, from her son. How do you know enough 
<laughs> how, you know, you're still young. Yeah, yeah. How, as you look back on it, and I marvel at what you were able to do. By the way, again, people who haven't seen the show, people who have seen the show will know what we're talking about. Right. People who haven't seen the show have to see the show. But what, what Ben just talking about now is the dynamic and the pain that the parents, and there are a number of parents in the show, but parents in the show go through pain as well. And you haven't been a parent. <laughs> you're, you're not 50 years old. Yeah. And yet you were able to in some way evoke the sense a, a parent has and where you know the vulnerability comes and where the longing comes and where the hope comes and how the, you know it, it starts with his mother wants him to get up out of bed get up out of bed and ultimately there's an arc to their relationship in this show that is just again brilliant and i believe one of the reasons why Evan Hansen, dear Evan Hansen, has been so successful, and you have a right to tell me you, you see it differently, is that it speaks at one and the same time to different generations who are in the audience who identify for, for, or feel for Evan Hansen, but the identification is with various characters of different ages, and therefore everybody who comes into that show feels benj in some way you've written about them thank you well i got i have to i have many responses to that one is thank you the, the second is you know every musicals are the most collaborative art form you can imagine because there are so many people working on them so you know if you like a character or you like what a character's singing it's because the book writer did an amazing job we have an amazing director you know michael greif who is the director of rent you know my my childhood show. How, luck, how lucky were you? How lucky are we? And, um, you know, Stacy Mindich, who is our lead producer, we could do a whole Dianu on this. You know what I mean? It's like if I had just had Stephen Levinson, Dianu. If I had just had Michael Greif, Dianu. So, um, you know, it was Stacy and Michael um, who really encouraged us younger writers to say, well, what's the parental perspective? And while I appreciate that you feel like there's resonance there, a lot of that also has to do with the actors who we were in conversation with while they were developing the roles. You know, Rachel Bay Jones and um, Jennifer Laura Thompson and Michael Park is these great actors who gave of themselves to teach us, you know, what their reactions would be. And the last thing I'll say is that, you know, one of the beauties of writing is that you get to put yourself in someone else's shoes and you get to exercise the muscle of empathy. And that is also a reason why we go to the theater in the first place, because we are forced to and because we love to say, hey, I wonder what that person's life is like without me having to live it. It's a forced exercise in empathy. And when you're a writer, you get to do it. When you're an audience member, you get to experience it. And um, for me, you know, getting to imagine what is it like to be a mom who is just so desperate to connect with her son and there are so many impediments along the way. What is it like to be a dad who didn't have a great relationship with his kid, but seize this opportunity to connect with a young person now and to, you know, right all of the wrongs of, of the old relationship that he had, you know, like it's just, it's getting to exercise empathy. And that is a real, real gift to be able to do every day. Um, you know, whether that be about age, about gender, about race, and that's all of our responsibilities. And I'm very lucky as a writer to, to be able to do that. But if we all take time to practice, hey, what is it like to be someone else? You know, and what are the things that, that they are going through? And what is the private pain that they might not be expressing on a daily basis? You know, musical theater gets to dive directly into that private pain or that hidden joy or whatever those secrets are that might not, you know, be on the surface. And so the more that we get to do that as writers, the more that we get to engage with that as audience members and as just people, um, I think it just makes us, uh, it makes us more attuned to other people's humanity, their struggles, their needs, their loves, their hardships. And I think it just makes people better people. I, I want to just jump through this camera. <laughs> Look, we have to begin to wrap up. Um, you know, it's interesting as I listen to you and I, I don't think you approach this consciously as a Jew, 
But as you just spoke, you know, in the Jewish tradition, there's a very famous drosh where somebody asks another person, do you love me? And the other person says, of course I love you. And the person says, well, do you know what gives me pain? Hmm. The person says, how do I know what gives you pain? And the first person says, then how can you say you love me? Hmm. And in the Jewish tradition, the real goal in life is healing the biggest hurt of human existence, and that's loneliness. Hmm. And the Jewish tradition is all about trying to save other people from pain. And the way we do that is by having empathy. And when I hear you talk about how that was one of the things that so hum somehow is at your core and drives you and your music and your storytelling, I get chills up and down, up and down, up and down. And again, I don't, I don't think it's something, I don't know that you would have ever expressed it in Jewish values, but I want you to understand if one day somebody ever asks you, you know, is there a Jewish, is there, did, did the Jewish tradition ever play into this? In some way, you got it. And whether you got it from your parents or you got it even from the, your, whatever experiences you had at the Quaker school, or you got it at whatever Hebrew school that you also describe marvelously in this pushback. And there's, you know, there are so many other things that I still want to talk to you about. The last question I have, and then we wrap up. Yeah. You talked about how much you love to tell stories mm. through music. Yeah. Evan Hansen is a story through music. Benj, is there a story you still want to tell musically? And I, I'm not saying, oh, this is the, you know, you and yeah. Justin are right now mu working on that musical. I'm not asking that question. I'm asking something about your soul. Is there a story or t is there a story Benj Pasek one day hopes to write? Yeah, you know, I think there are things that get stuck in, in your brain or in your, in your soul that you, you, have to, you have to get out somehow. And, you know, Evan Hansen for me was that it was this thing that I was grappling with and one and wrote about in different forms, whether it be poetry or short stories or in songs or whatever. And I needed to talk about it somehow. Um, and I don't know what that is yet for me. I don't know what that next thing is. Uh, uh, I'm sure that it's deeply buried, you know, subconsciously and it'll come out. Um, but like at this moment, uh, I feel two things. One is that I, I have a, a, the gift to be able to tell stories professionally and I get to not necessarily only tell my stories, but get to help other people tell their stories. And in this moment, I think of reckoning that we're realizing systemic privilege that we have in this country, those of us who do have the opportunity to be able to tell stories, one of the things that we have to do is not just tell the things that are swimming around in our own hearts and souls, but also help be facilitators for other people who haven't gotten to tell their stories yet. So that's something I'm really keen and passionate about trying to figure out, you know, how do you, it's, you know, to relate it to a Jewish theme for one moment, you know, why do we tell the Passover story year after year? It's to remind us that we once were enslaved and we did not have freedom and now we do have freedom and it's our responsibility as free people to help other people who are not as free. I've been given a lot of opportunities. So yeah, there are things that I want to write and I'm sure that life experience will, you know, force them out of me in some way or another. Um, but right now I'm really excited about the opportunity to, to look around, you know, right before we got on this call, I was just uh, on a call with a friend of mine who, um, you know, who wouldn't necessarily think, you know, to tell, his personal story, you know, uh, in, in a certain way. And I think, you know, if I can be helpful in drawing that out or providing resources or connecting him or helping to think, you know, dramaturgically about how to tell that story to help that come out of, of, of his body and, and, and get to see the light of day and go out into the world and change people, um, which I know that it will, 
that feels like a really worthwhile endeavor until, you know, I figure out the next thing that moves my soul in, in such that's a way. One, that's a wonderful answer. And it's, it's so fitting for you. Do you ever say to yourself, holy cow, <laughs> I am, you know, in now this world at this level. <laughs> Do you ever stop and say to yourself, oh, oh my goodness. Yeah, I think, you know, you have to take stock of that. And if you ever get used to it, there's something, there's something off. Um, yeah, I, I, I just, I, I think about now that I'm here, who else can I help to get to this place? You know what I mean? And, and um, how can I share that with more people? Because um, it's, it's, it's really a gift. You know, I said at the beginning, you are, you are brilliant at your craft. And you're still at the very beginning. There's so much more opportunity for you. And I believe that you're going to use that opportunity to help other people. And the stories you tell will not only be stories necessarily of your own, but stories that you will help other people tell. And that's so sweet of you. But as brilliant as you are in your craft, that's how lovely a person you are. <laughs> and, and again, I am so lucky that because I get to do you know, Lechayim on JBS, I got to meet you. Kol Tu Lecha, only happiness, success in whatever you do. And again, I really hope, Benj, at some point when, when we're back on the street, we'll find time to meet together and maybe again you'll, you'll be in the studio. But thank you for spending so much time with us on JBS. Absolutely. And thank you for such a warm, lovely uh, interview and, um, and asking me questions that I, I really get to, to, to think about in a, in, a, in a deep and meaningful way. So, so thank you for, for this and thanks for the time. And that was Benj Pasek, one of America's great contemporary composers and lyricists. And again, if you haven't seen Dear Evan Hansen, please be sure to do so when Broadway opens. And watch for Pasek and Paul's upcoming films, Aladdin and Snow White. And I hope you enjoyed meeting him as much as I did. What a remarkable young man. As always, I hope you'll be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have to any ideas expressed on this edition of the Chaim. Please email me at rabbigolub at jbstv.org. And you can write me in our new Stamford P.O. Box. P.O. Box 360, Stanford, Connecticut, 06904. And remember, you can now download the L'Chaim podcast and listen to L'Chaim in any room of your house or on the treadmill or as you do your morning run or as you're floating off to sleep, the L'Chaim podcast. And so until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'Chaim, my friends, to life. The time is a presentation of Jewish education in media. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut, 06904. Or you can call the JBS Pledge Line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.